This morning we're in part three of our series. You know, we've been looking at Colossians, and so we're up to chapter three. And I'm excited about this chapter because this chapter uh, really begins the, the behavior part of Paul's treatise. I mean, he's, he's basically saying, hey, Colossians, look at all this incredible stuff that's been given to you in the gospel. Uh, you had no hope and you had no God and you had nothing. And now all of this has been poured into your life by God himself. And then he's going to get into behavior. And what I love about this is he connects the two. He connects the riches in Christ to the behavior. He connects what God did to what we do. Did you get that? He connects what God did to what we do. So as I like to remind people, I mean, man, if you just just preach what we do, what we do, what we do, it's like chopping every one of Paul's letters in half and deciding that you're going to teach chapters 3, 4, and 5, but skip chapters 1 and 2. And that's basically what legalism is. Legalism chops all of Paul's and Peter's and James's letters in half and says, I'm going to teach the behavior verses with no foundation to them. And so what we'll see today is a beautiful weaving of two truths. The weaving together of two truths in chapter 3. We're going to see the truths of what God did for you and then the truths of about our daily decision-making and what really works, given that we have new hearts. It's going to be fun. So we start off, why behave? I mean, why does behavior matter? Now, the reason we have to ask this question is because the gospel is so powerful. We have to ask it because the gospel is so incredible. I mean, the gospel says you're not going to be judged for your sins. The gospel says there's no condemnation for you. The gospel says your sins are forgiven and forgotten forever, no matter what. The gospel says you're loved, you're respected, you've been given a place of honor in God's family, and it's irrevocable. That means it it won't be revoked. It won't be taken away. So obviously then you say, why behave? And Paul gives us a big because. So watch this now. The next few verses he's going to link what God has done for you, and then what we do as daily choices. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So there's an old expression, when in Rome. You heard this? When in, I'm not talking about what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> I'm talking about when in Rome. We use this expression all the time, right? When in Rome, do as the Romans do. That means if you're in someone's home, respect their customs. If you're in a certain place, you do what they do, right? In order to, well, enjoy their hospitality, to fit in, to be like them to some degree. And so the issue here is that Paul is basically saying the same thing. He's saying when in heaven, when in heaven, do as heavenly people do. Because see... You've been raised up, and you've got a spiritual place. Everybody is somewhere geographically, right? Geographically, you're in heaven. You're in West Texas, or you're out there in Idaho. Sorry about a few weeks ago, you you wrote me that letter. I mentioned how Idaho, I picked it at random in another sermon. Somebody really got their feelings hurt over Idaho. But you're in Idaho. You're in West Texas. That's your physical location, Right? But everybody has a spiritual location too. So when in Rome, do as the Romans do. When in heaven, do as the heavens do. And so what he's saying here is you've been raised up with Christ. Keep seeking the things above. You could not. You know that? I mean, we prove that all the time, don't we? We could not. We could not seek the things above. We could seek the depressing thoughts. We could seek the condemning thoughts. We could seek the gossipy thoughts. We could seek all the lustful thoughts. We could seek all these other thoughts. We can. We prove that we can. All he's saying is you could do that, but hey, do you know where you are? When in Rome, do as the Romans do. When in heaven, do as the heavens do. And so he's saying you've got a spiritual geography and just imagine, it's like, it's like saying when the thought comes next time, you know which thought I'm talking about. The thoughts that we struggle with, when the thought comes, 
Imagine yourself in that moment seated right next to God. Not in a, not in a convicting, horrible, guilty way. See, when I say that, if your mind gravitates toward, oh, oh, God's here. God's here. Now I better really shape up, right? Because God showed up. Well, God is always in you, and you are always in God. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. He never leaves. So here's, here's the strange thing. Proximity to God, closeness to God, is the new normal. It's totally normal. In fact, you're living in it, and you've maybe been living in it so long now that you don't even notice. You were expecting that if you're in the presence of God, that there would be a bright light and a buzz of electricity or something. It's like that moment before you get hit by lightning, you know, when everything sort of electrifies around you. Maybe that's what it feels like to have God near you or in you, we might think. The reality is, is that 24-7, you are in the Spirit, and the Spirit is in you. So this is very human. This is very normal. And so he's saying, because of this incredible, miraculous normal, that's what it is. It's a miraculous normal. Because of the miraculous normal, keep seeking things above because of who you are and where you are. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. What a beautiful phrase. He's saying, let your mind match your life. You see that? He's saying, let your mind match your life. No one can change your life. No one can snatch your life away. Christ is your life. That is a permanent life. It is an irrevocable life. It is an indestructible life. Hebrews says it is the power of an indestructible life. You have an indestructible salvation. No one can take it. No one can steal it. No one can destroy it. You will never be out of his hands. Now, let your mind match your life. That's what he's saying. So, it's almost like we've got two things here, and they're always in motion. We've got life in the Spirit, never stopping, always constant, God always persistent in counseling us, and then we have the mind where we've got choices to make, and we're responding to this message. People say, you keep talking about the finished work of Christ, but what about, what about our daily choices? Well, here we're seeing the two collide, right? But the daily choices are based on the finished work. Because Christ is my life, set my mind on things above. They fit together. So, is the Christian life easy? No. The Christian life is impossible. The Christian life is absolutely impossible apart from this. So he's saying, set your mind on things above, not on the earth. Let your mind match your life. And by the way, your life is encased. I mean, your life is wrapped up in God. Your life is enveloped. Your life is sealed. People are worried about losing their salvation. He's saying, look where you are, man. I mean, you've been hidden. The enemy can't even find you. First John says the enemy cannot even touch you. This verse is basically saying the enemy cannot even find your salvation to go after it. And so... We get shipwrecked in our daily choices sometimes, but our life is rock solid, secure, hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, stop there, what a great phrase. We make uh, Christ our priority, right? We get out our daily planner. You get out your daily planner and you put Christ in there somewhere. You know what I'm talking about? Well, Christ is in there at 6 o'clock because that's when I do my devotions. Well, you know, that's a, that's a really um, shallow way of looking at Christ in our life, isn't it? I mean, the reality is, is that we don't plan or prioritize or organize Christ into our life as some sort of priority. The, the gospel is bigger than that. The gospel is saying Christ is not a piece of your life or a priority in your life. There, there's a deeper truth here, and it's like, I, I feel like, it's so hard for us to communicate to other people, and it's so hard for us sometimes to remember. But it's like, you know, the very atoms, the very molecules, the very substance that makes up your physical body. Well, Christ is the substance that makes up your spirituality. Christ is the substance that, that 
that birthed you as a new creation in Christ. So just as you could put yourself on an operating table, so to speak, and they could put a, a microscope up to your physicality and look into what makes you you physically. Well, if we put you on a spiritual operating table and we had a spiritual microscope to look at what makes you you, well, when we got down to the atomic level, when we got down to all of the, the atoms and the, the different substances that, that make you you, we're, what we're going to see is that it's all Christ, that Christ makes you you. And so it's, it's an interesting phrase, Christ who is our life. And then it says that when he comes back, that you'll be revealed with him. See, we always make a big deal about him appearing, and that is incredible, and it's going to be awesome. Him appearing, and we go to meet him in the air. Thessalonians talks about those who remain will go and meet him in the air, and he'll, be, he'll appear, and there'll be a sound, and there'll be a trumpet, and everybody's going to be either freaked out or totally celebrating or both, okay? But the big deal also is that you get revealed with him. He lets you he lets you be a part of this. He lets you be a part of the celebration. You're celebrating him. He's celebrating you. That is so bizarre. That when Christ returns, you celebrate him and he celebrates you. He was celebrating you in the garden when he prayed to his father and said, thank you for those whom you have given me. He was celebrating you. And he's going to be celebrating you again and he celebrates you now. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. So the legalist gets out their pad at this point. They get out, you know, the long legal pad, the yellow ones. My dad was an attorney when I was growing up. He was, a, he was an attorney, and so he didn't have the normal length pads. He had the extra long ones, you know. They really kind of, they scared me a bit, you know. Because if he was going to list all the stuff I'd done wrong, he sure had enough room. But we would get out, we would get out our, our legal pads, wouldn't we, as legalists. And when we look at a verse like this, and we would say, okay, all right, here's the, here's the five or six things I'm going to avoid. All right, this week I'm going to focus on avoiding immorality. I'm going to focus on impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, and uh, then also idolatry. Now, the only problem with that is... This is just like one verse out of one book. And so you start filling your pad, you fill in your pad, and fill in your pad, and eventually you've got a, a full 25, 30 sheets of paper that are filled up about all the stuff you're not supposed to be doing. And then all you got to do is focus on those 217 things, right? So what, what does this really look like? Well, there's something that came before this. When, when Paul says, therefore... We always ask, what is the therefore, therefore, right? <laughs> what is the therefore, therefore? Well, we go back, we go back a verse, and we see Christ is your life, man. Therefore, because Christ is your life, not because God's going to get you, not because you're going to be punished, not because you're going to be condemned, not because God's going to be hacked off at you, but because Christ is your life, therefore, look at this tool called your body, your hands and your feet, your mouth, your eyes. Look at this tool called your body and consider it dead to sin. All kinds of sin. 31 flavors of sin. Consider your body is dead to sin. Sin isn't going to work for you anymore. Now, what I love about this is that the body is not evil. Many people will teach, even some solid Christian teachers, they end up sort of veering off and saying that the body is evil. So it's you against your body, and you, you know the body wants to sin because the body is so sinful and evil, but you're good, and so you have to say no to the body to say yes to you, no to the body to say yes to God. Well, the body is not the enemy. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And your body here, it says, you should consider that it's dead to sin. So sin is really ugly, but God made your body. Sin is really ugly, and sin can use your body. But don't offer your body to sin. Offer your body to God. So our bodies can be offered either way. 
But the body is not the enemy. That's some wrong thinking, isn't it? All right. Thank you. (laughs) For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. So, again, we get to a verse like this. We could pull it out of context. We could miss the whole point. We see the word wrath. We freak out. We start crying uncontrollably. Oh, my gosh. God's going to get me. God's going to get me. God's going to punish me. Look, wrath. See, I knew this grace, but but the wrath. Okay. We're going to have to balance these, right? Well, actually not. We're not going to have to balance these. We're not going to have to factor this into your life unless you're a son of disobedience. Are you a son of disobedience or are you a son of God? Are you a child of God or are you a child of disobedience? Who are you? Because this verse goes on to say that you once were those people. That's who you were at one point in the past. But now you're not in Adam, you're in Christ. You're not in the flesh, you're in the spirit. And so this is why he says, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. So there's living and walking. And we see this all over the Bible. There's living and there's walking. So a Christian is living in the Spirit, but they're not always walking by the Spirit, right? It's possible that we're living in the Spirit, but not walking by the Spirit in a given moment. Those are choices. Now, as you look at this, what he's saying is, remember when you guys used to walk in those things all the time. Why? Well, because you were living in them. It's all you knew. It was your identity. It was your nature, but not anymore. And so this wrath of God is coming upon them, but it's not coming upon you. Well, then why is this verse here? Because he's saying, obviously God doesn't like this stuff. Obviously God's not for this stuff. And Christ is your life. It's the same Christ who's going to bring wrath upon them. Well, he lives in you. He's obviously against that stuff. So don't let that stuff reign in you. Not because God's going to get you but because of the nature of Christ in you. Now also, put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. So again, it's like saying, you know, um, in the mafia movies, you know, we look at verse uh, 6 and 7, 8 and 9. It says... You were in those things and now put them aside. Don't lie to one another because you're basically saying you died to them. And the mafia movies, they would say this kind of thing, right? Some dude, Donnie Brasco type dude would do something. And then the mafia lord, he would turn to him and he would say, Son! Son, you're dead to me. Right? You know what I'm talking about. And when he would say that, the relate, yeah, thank you. Yeah, like it's all I got. It's all I got. When he would say that, the relationship was cut off. I mean, that guy could have been a made man, right? That guy could have been in. That guy could have been cool with everybody. But if, if, if you say that that guy is dead to you, then you're in the place of deciding no relationship, totally cut off from that person. We're not talking, we're not communicating, forget you, right? Well, that's basically. What this passage is saying is that we are dead to these things. So forget them. Forget about them, right? Forget about them because you're dead to them. Totally makes sense. It's logical. Given your nature, given your identity, given who you are, you could do this, but this thing is a foreign thing. It doesn't fit. You could try to play it out and play act like you're somebody else, but man, you can't help it anymore. You are a child of God. You're the, you're, the, you're the image of God himself. God has given birth to you. You can't get away from it. So don't lie to one another. Is it because we shouldn't lie? Thou shalt not bear false witness. We get out our law mentality. Well, we're more grown up than that here. He's appealing to us for a reason. Don't lie to one another because that's what the old self would do. But you're not the old self. You're the new self. 
So he's saying discard these things. Uh, it's like pressing the eject button. Eject these things. Have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Okay, so uh, 15 years ago, I got married. I live in a married state. I'm married. I'm 100% married. Yeah. But I'm still getting to know my wife. And she's getting to know me. And so what you see is that my status has changed. I'm in a married status, but still there's an adventure of getting to know each other. Well, look at this. You've put on the new self. That's done. You're not putting on the new self. You've put on the new self. You can't get any newer than you already are. You're heaven ready. The Lord comes back in this moment. You're not trying to slap something on at the last minute. Oh, wait, wait, wait. He's at the door. I got to get dressed with some spirituality. No, no, no. You've put on the new self, and then it says, who is being renewed to what? To a true knowledge. To a true knowledge of who? Of Christ. So we're getting to know the Christ that we already know. We're getting to know the Christ that we're already married to. And a renewal, this is a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So what is this saying? It's saying the law is totally irrelevant. I mean, I got people who write me still and they're emailing me and they're talking to me on Facebook and they're saying, you know, I understand what you're saying about grace, 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 but we still need, but we still need. And sometimes it's the Sabbath or sometimes it's the Ten Commandments or sometimes it's just a few of the commandments that are particularly concerning to them. And what we need to see here is that these Greek people who heard the gospel, they couldn't identify Moses in a lineup. I mean, they, they didn't know Moses from a hole in the wall. They couldn't even, many of them, these Colossians, they couldn't even recite the Ten Commandments. You ask them, many, you know, what's embarrassing is many of us. You know, you interview Christians. I guess it's embarrassing. I don't know. But you interview Christians, and we can't recite the Ten Commandments. But then we'll go, you know, on Facebook or email or get out there in theological debates in a coffee shop with somebody, and we're fighting for those Ten Commandments. We can't even recite them. We might get to like seven of them, you know, but not all ten. So we're hoping that God grades on a curve, right? But the reality is, is that the gospel is saying, you know what, person who's never heard of the Ten Commandments, person who's heard of them but can't recite them, sorry to say that to the center group here, but, and then person who knows the Ten Commandments backwards and forwards, none of that is, is relevant. You know, that's not relevant to your life in Christ, that you are dead to the law. There's no, you should have no spiritual relationship with the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments are the Word of God, the Ten Commandments, the law, is holy and righteous and good. Everything from Genesis to Revelation is the Word of God, inspired by Him. But you don't have to take work off on Saturdays. That's one of the ten, isn't it? Then we say, okay, well, I need the nine, right? And so we start whittling down and getting it the way we like it. But the reality is there is no distinction between this group and this group and this group. There is no distinction between Greek and Jew between the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Why? Because Christ is everything. He's the big deal. All right, well, we're going to finish up with uh, a few more spots here. Next, he talks about getting dressed. He says, so, given your identity, you're chosen, you're holy, you're beloved. He says, now what are you going to wake up and put on? Put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Not because it earns you something, but because it fits. In the Old Testament, the priests, you know, the Old Testament priests would wear particular garments. I mean, if you go back and you look in Leviticus, you look in the Old Testament, there's descriptions of what they should wear. And it's pretty impressive stuff. I mean, if you weren't a Levite, you kind of walked around the Levites with full respect. Because when they were in their regalia, it was pretty impressive. Well... You look at a business meeting. You walk into a super formal business meeting, and there's some people decked out in three-piece suits. Some of them have the pinstripes in them. I see the, the pinstripes, and I start to freak out a little bit. I mean, that's getting pretty seriously formal. You'll notice I'm rather informal. But 
you get around the suits and, and they got stripes in them, then things are getting serious, right? And so our attire, what we wear, kind of sets the tone, doesn't it? It sets the tone. It sets the mood. And uh, people relate to us sometimes based on what we're wearing, like it or not. So many people get their identity from their clothes or part of their identity from their clothes, right? So it's nice to be relevant and be current and wear clothes that look good on you and that sort of thing. But sometimes clothes become everything for somebody. Well, there's really only, only one time when that's okay. And, and here it is. What he's saying is put on what's already in. Put on the outside what's already on the inside. Put on a heart of compassion. Why? Because you've got Christ in your heart and he's compassionate. Put on gentleness. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's in you and the fruit of him is gentleness. So put on what's already in. So otherwise, Christianity is is faking it. You see that? Christianity is faking it. It's putting on a mask. It's be compassionate even though you don't want to. Be kind even though you don't want to. Be friendly, be, be good, be, even though you don't want to. And that's fake. That's religion. What's awesome about Christianity is that we are putting on what's already in. And we're simply being ourselves. Bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Now we're going to finish here today, and I just want to point out that this verse is basically the polar opposite of the Lord's Prayer. You remember the Lord's Prayer. You know, Jesus starts off and he says, by the way, before I get started, folks, uh, he says, uh, don't, don't repeat a bunch of prayers over and over and over mindlessly, repetitiously. Don't pick a particular prayer and just like keep repeating it, you know, as these guys over here do on the street corner. And then he says, let me show you how to pray. And then he gives them like, you know, an example says, you want to pray? Here's how to pray. Under the law, before the cross, here's how to pray. And then what do we do? We pick up that prayer, and for 2,000 years, we recite it ritualistically over and over. And many of us, we don't even realize what we're saying. He just got done saying, don't pray this prayer over and over and over. What do we do? We pray it over and over and over. So that's confusing. But, But then you look at what the Lord's Prayer says. He's talking to Jews, it's before the cross, before the blood sacrifice, and he says this. He says, forgive me, Father, forgive me, just as I've forgiven other people. And then, if you don't think he really means that, he actually concludes with, for if you forgive others, God will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, God will not forgive you. So imagine that's your theology. That if you do your part first, God will do his part. If you don't do your part, God won't do his part and you will remain unforgiven. In this scenario, are you earning forgiveness? In this scenario, are you earning forgiveness? Absolutely. You are earning God's forgiveness by forgiving other people first or you are losing out on God's forgiveness by not forgiving other people first. Now, look at this verse. Does this verse communicate that? This verse communicates the opposite. This verse says, forgive others. Why? Because the Lord already forgave you. Which came first? God initiated on the cross through Christ. He forgave you. That's what salvation is. Hey, you called upon my name, forgiven, and new life. You called upon my name, forgiven, and new life. That's what salvation is. That person is a forgiven person. And then they read Colossians 3.13. It's like God saying, hey, remember what I did for you? I forgave you. I let you off the hook. I showed you grace and mercy and compassion unconditionally. So pass it on. Pass it on to other people. Not to earn anything. Not to get anything from me. But because I've already given you what you've got, total forgiveness. So forgive others as the Lord already forgave you. Now, how can this be different from the Lord's Prayer? That's simple, the cross. It's real simple, the cross. The cross 
is our means to forgiveness. The cross is where Jesus' blood was shed. So what do you tell people when there's been no cross yet? What do you tell people when they're looking to pray and they're beating their chests in religiosity and they're proud and they think they're doing okay according to the law? What you do is you throw them a curveball. You throw them five or six curveballs, right? Sell everything. Cut off your hand. Pluck out your eye. Be perfect, just like God. Forgive in order to be forgiven, otherwise you're up a creek. You throw them some curveballs, and they're going, what? And they're getting hit, and they're going, I can't do this. And Jesus is saying, exactly. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And then on this side of the cross, we don't get conditional forgiveness. We get unconditional forgiveness, and that's what's being taught here. All right, well, let's stop there for today, and let's give thanks to God. Father, we thank you for this message of grace that is all about you deciding to initiate. You chase after us. You pursue us. You present the gospel to us. We open the door, and from that day forward, you have moved in. You became our life. We're forgiven Freed from the law, no relationship with it, dead to it, alive to you. Father, for some of us, it seems so controversial. For you, it's so very normal that you would dwell in Adam and Eve and walk with them. And then that's ruined. And then through Christ, you dwell in us and walk with us all over again. So very normal. The normal human life. Father, we thank you for this life, which is Christ. We thank you for the total forgiveness of sins. And we thank you that we get to wake up every day and put on love and put on compassion. And it's not being fake. It's simply being who we already are. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. goes in a particular direction it doesn't go in the opposite direction it never goes in the opposite direction it always goes in one way you know certain laws will always govern your universe your life that is there's the the law of the spirit of life that is that sin will never work and that the spirit is always taking you in the direction of life because the spirit is your life now we're going to prove this law one way or another we're going to prove it by putting on bitterness and being miserable. Or we're gonna put on compassion and be fulfilled. We're gonna put on love and be content at the core of our being. Or we're gonna put on hate and feel really weird about it. Either way, we're gonna prove that there are certain laws that govern our universe in Christ. That we are destined for love, we're designed for love, we're built from the ground up 
to let, to allow, to give permission to Christ so that Christ can be Christ in and through us. And when we let him do what he does, we're doing what we do. We're doing what we do best. We're doing the only thing that truly fulfills us. Have a great day.